21. I have to tell you before we get into this, we're looking at verses 25 through 28 that I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture tonight. I know that you're not used to that. I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture tonight, and I'm going to read uh, passages that I think are very important to be able to fill out this particular study that we're looking at because we're looking at an abbreviated study related to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so beginning at verse 25, reading to verse 28, Luke chapter 21, Luke writes, "'There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and a great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now, as we've been looking at Luke chapter 21, those of you who have been with me through this study, we know that we've been looking at, uh, at the period in, uh, in history that's called the last days. And so, we are now looking at a, a section of that period that is called the tribulation. And that's what we're looking at here, is we're looking at this period called the tribulation, the tribulation being uh, a seven-year period of God pouring out His wrath on unbelieving man. It's a, it's a seven-year period that you find in Scripture that relates to God pouring out His judgment. And when you hear of the tribulation, you think of a couple of things. One is you know that the tribulation, this seven-year period, is divided into two sections. You have the first three and a half years that are referred to as tribulation. The last three and a half years, Jesus refers to as great tribulation. And so it's a seven-year period of God pouring out His wrath. It's called the wrath of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 6. It's a time when God is pouring out His wrath on, on the world. And, and basically, there are two purposes in this time called the tribulation. And I want to lay this as a foundation so that we can enter into verse 25 and have a, have a background and understand basically what Jesus is speaking about. So there are two basic purposes of this time period called the tribulation. One, it's for God to judge all who have rejected Him and all who have rejected Messiah, all who have rejected Jesus Christ. In Isaiah in chapter 26, verse 21, uh, the writer said, Behold, the Lord is coming out of His dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed upon her. She will conceal her slain no longer. And so Isaiah tells us very clearly there's a time coming when God is going to come out of His dwelling, come from heaven, if you will, and punish the people of the earth for their sins. And that's what you find taking place during this time called the tribulation. You see, instead of worshiping the true God, instead of worshiping the Lamb of God, the world has rejected Him. And as we've been looking at this period, and I've shown you a few of these things already in this chapter, we know that they have rejected God, they've rejected Jesus, and what happens during this period called the tribulation is instead of receiving Jesus Christ, they receive someone that we refer to in Scripture as Antichrist. And what happens is the world actually begins to follow after a world leader, a coming world ruler that is called by a variety of names in Scripture, one of them being the Antichrist, and in doing so, they're rejecting God and rejecting Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And the beast is just another name for the Antichrist. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. And so the, the inhabitants of the earth, and he says all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. There are going to be those who are following after him, wondering after him, and the result of that, obviously, is their judgment. During this time, spiritual deception is rampant. During this time called the tribulation, there's going to be a, a commonality of a rejection of Messiah and an openness to spiritual deception. And uh, Jesus had already made that very clear when he was asked, what is the sign of his coming? And all, and he had said, be careful and take heed that, that no one deceives you. He had already made it very clear in Matthew chapter 24 that deception was going to be the earmark of that time. And that's what's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to make an appearance. And as he does so, he will deceive the whole world. The whole world will desire this beast. 
and the Lord allows them to pursue them. In Revelation, again, chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, uh, John writes, All the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this coming world ruler will have the world pursuing him, marveling over him. He'll have a false prophet. And the false prophet is going to promote the rejection of God and the acceptance of this one referred to as Antichrist. Again, in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 14, John says, I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And so he has a false prophet who promotes worship for the Antichrist, all of this taking place in the last days, especially during the tribulation. And so, as a result of that, judgment falls because the people are willingly doing this. They are willingly rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and following after him. Now, Paul, when he was writing to the Thessalonians in chapter 2 in 2 Thessalonians, verses 9 through 12, said it this way. And again, he gives us a name for Antichrist. We've seen Antichrist, the beast. He's also referred to as the lawless one. And here in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. And so what takes place in the uh, influence, under the influence of the, of the uh, false prophet is the world wonders after the beast. They say, who can make war with him? Who is like him? And as a result of that, God will give them over to their, their passions, which is to reject him and to accept Antichrist. They did not receive. And notice with me, Paul calls it the love of the truth. It's more than just being an admirer of the truth, a philosopher. There needs to be, you have to have more than just a, a, a liking or a friendship relationship with knowledge and truth. You have to love the truth. And the world will not receive the love of the truth. Believers do. Believers love truth because we know that truth is a person and not just a proposition. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we love the truth because Jesus, the Word of God, has taken upon himself human flesh, and therefore truth has been incarnated before us. And so we love the truth in that we love Jesus and what he has taught us. And so, one, we know that the uh, tribulation is a time where God is going to judge those who have rejected him and Messiah. But two, we know that the tribulation is intended to prepare Israel to meet and to receive her Messiah. You see, during the tribulation period, the seven-year period of time, God actually purges the nation of Israel of its unbelief. You see that in Isaiah, in chapter 13, verses 6 through 11, where Isaiah writes, Well, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp, every man's heart will melt, terror will seize them, pain and anguish will grip them, they will writhe like a woman in labor, they will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. So what happens is the Lord brings his judgment and begins to purge the nation of Israel, and he brings about the conversion of a multitude of Jews because this tribulation is actually acting as a refiner's fire, and it purges Israel, drawing them to their Messiah. 
That's what Zechariah 13, 9 says when Zechariah the prophet says, this third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver, test them like gold. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. They will say, the Lord is our God. And so two-thirds, it would seem that two-thirds of Israel will perish during the tribulation, but one-third will be brought through the refiner's fire and become the children of the Lord. So God has these people who are going to be refined. Now, out of that one-third that Zechariah speaks about will be a multitude of evangelists. They're going to be Jewish Billy Grahams. Jewish Moshe Grahams, you know, that's what they're going to be. In Revelation, in chapter 7, verse 4, John says, I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. These are going to be 144,000 evangelists. And according to chapter 14 in the book of Revelation, verses 1 through 5, God is going to protect them as they go forth and take his message out. Now, this is all taking place during the period called the tribulation, but this is taking place in the first three and a half years. Now, the tribulation, when you look at it in the book of uh, Revelation, is actually broken down in uh, chapters 6 following to uh, chapter 16. And, and when you look at that in Revelation, and you can actually see it moving on into chapter 19 in some ways, but most of it takes place in chapter 6 through 16. What you see is you see a progressive escalation of judgment. If you were to take the time, in other words, to, to read Revelation and you got to chapter 6, all you need to do is start in chapter 6 and you'll read to chapter 16. And what you see is a description of this period called the tribulation that's being outlined for you. And it, it's really from the beginning to the end that you can see it. And, and what you have is a series of judgments that are outlined for us in those chapters. You, you have uh, actually basically three judgments that are spoken of. You have what are called the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and then you, you conclude uh, with what are called the bowl judgments. And you see that by going through the book of Revelation. And what I'm going to do at this point is just kind of like share with you a little bit about those judgments so that you can see what's taking place, because all of this is important for us when we look at verse 25 here in Luke chapter 21, and I promise you we will get that within three weeks. We'll, we will be there. Actually, I'll get there in a few minutes. But I wanted to lay this as a foundation so you can know what Jesus is speaking about here in verse 25. So when you look at Revelation, Revelation chapter 6 actually gives to us an overview uh, and, and some detail concerning the, uh, the period called the tribulation. So Revelation chapter 6 uh, introduces the seal judgments. Now, Jesus takes a scroll, and the seal is broken. And when that seal is broken, and we believe that that scroll that he holds is the title deed of the earth, Jesus now begins to allow judgment to come on the, on the world and all, and that's what you see with these sealed judgments. And what happens is you see a, very, a variety of things. For example, when the first seal is broken, the Antichrist is revealed. And he's pictured as beginning to conquer, and he does so initially in a peaceful manner. That's how the nation of Israel, according to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, is going to ultimately have a, an agreement or a covenant with, uh, with the Antichrist. It's because he doesn't come on and disclose himself for what he is at the beginning. So initially, as he comes on the scene, he's going to begin to conquer, but he's going to do it diplomatically. But ultimately, he... Um, He's going to be revealed for who he is. And so what happens is peace then is taken from the earth. That's the second seal. And warfare breaks out to consolidate his power. And then as a result of war, the third seal is broken and famine breaks out. Then the fourth seal is broken. With famine will come pestilence. And, and the Bible says one quarter of the earth will perish. Then the fifth seal is going to be broken and incredible persecution will strike believers. Millions will be martyred. And then the sixth seal is broken, which brings natural disasters, including earthquakes and meteorite showers. And this is all taking place at the beginning to about the middle of the tribulation. So when you get to chapter 8 and 9, a continuation, you have the seventh seal opened. When that seventh seal is opened, a new series of judgments erupts that are called the trumpet judgments. 
You have the first judgment, which is hail and fire mingled with blood thrown to the earth. One third of vegetation is gone. Second, you have a giant mountain, an asteroid possibly, that falls into the Mediterranean Sea. A third of the sea, life dies. A third, the third seal is opened and a great burning star, perhaps a meteorite, uh, falls from heaven. A third of the water becomes undrinkable. Then the fourth in the trumpet judgment series occurs and a third of the sun, moon, and stars are now struck, so a third of the day loses light. Then fifth, you have hordes of demons turned loose upon the earth to torment its inhabitants. Then sixth, you have a demonically led army of 200 million marching and destroying one-third of the inhabitants of the earth. Now, when you, you know, just reading this to you makes, makes me queasy. I mean, the thought of it. I've had people tell me, you know, and this is hard to believe, but I've had people tell me, I'm going to wait around to see what the tribulation is really all about. I, I don't get that at all. I really, I really do not get that mentality too. But it's the same kind of mentality that some people have when they say, well, I'm going to go to hell because all my friends are going to be there and we're just going to party forever. It's that same kind of craziness. It's just like you're not, you're not thinking with both sides of the brain. You know, you don't want to go to hell and you certainly don't want to be here on the face of the earth when tribulation is hitting. If you think it's bad right now with the, you know, the onset of a recession and losing your, your uh, funds in the bank, you don't know what you're talking about. If you're thinking that you can weather through a period like this with so much cataclysm happening. In chapter 11, uh, verse 15, the seventh trumpet sounds, and, and that is going to be occurring in the last portion of the tribulation. And so when, when that trumpet is blown, the last series of judgments comes, which is the bowl judgments. So in chapter 16, when the bowl judgments begin to be described, you have first foul and loathsome sores, coming upon men who receive the mark of the beast. The second, the, the sea turns to blood. Every living sea creature dies. And third, fresh water is polluted so no one can drink. Then fourth, the sun no longer is filtered, so heat combined with boils and thirst just causes people to be in incredible pain and misery. Then the fifth judgment is darkness increases. Then six, the Euphrates River is dried up and an army from the east begins to march. And the sixth bowl prepares the way for the invasion of the kings from the east so that they, with the beast's armies, might come and ultimately find judgment in a place called Armageddon. And then seventh, the great convulsion completely overthrows the ordered affairs of man as they experience the fierce, fierceness of God's wrath. I'm going to read that to you out of Revelation chapter 16. If you'd like to turn there with me for a moment, Revelation chapter 16. Let me read to you the seventh bowl. A great convulsion overthrows the ordered affairs of man. They experience the fierceness of God's wrath. Seventh bowl. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. There was a great earthquake, such, uh, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon was remembered before God, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. The incredible judgment, the experience that they're having, the earth is convulsing under the wrath of God. And all of this is taking place during this period of time called the tribulation, where God is pouring out his wrath on unbelieving man, where God is purging the nation of Israel because Israel has rejected her Messiah. And so in Luke, this is basically what Jesus is, is presenting to us, and this is what we're going to look at here in Luke chapter 21 as we look at verses 25 through 28. This is what's taking place. And so in Luke chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus says there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. 
and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken." So all of this is taking place before the return of Jesus Christ. This is all taking place at the conclusion of this period called the tribulation. It's interesting when Jesus is speaking about this, and it's recorded in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, that Jesus makes it very clear that this uh, this occurs at the conclusion of the tribulation because in Matthew 24, 24, he said, in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened. So Jesus says his return is going to take place after the tribulation. So obviously, Obviously, this is the end of the seven-year period called the tribulation. He says there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars on the earth. You see, in this, this agrees with the Old Testament prophecy. Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31 uh, says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. We've seen that kind of thing take place. It could be something like an eclipse. It could be a variety of things, of course. It could be something that is uh, totally supernatural. It could also be something that is basically the result of God pouring out judgment because we know that uh, back in the early 90s when, when, uh, when we were there in the, in the Gulf War and all that, uh, some of the oil, oil uh, wells had been uh, set on fire and the smoke of the, of the, burn, the burning uh, was so intense and so thick that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face and the the sun actually was blotted out for those who were in that area. So we know this is a possibility. This doesn't have to be just some kind of uh, picturesque language or some kind of uh, just illustrating using metaphor or or something of that nature. This is something that is literal. That's what's going to take place and the Word of God makes it very clear that that's going to take place. Isaiah again in chapter 13 verse 10 said, the stars of heaven their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. These are the things that are going to take place. And as it's happening, as this is going on and this distress of nations is occurring and this perplexity and all of the nat- nature is in revolt, notice verse 26, what happens to man? Man who at one time is so brave and so arrogant, his heart is now failing him from fear. He finally wakes up and realizes that he is not the master of his own destiny. He's not the captain of his own ship. He needs help. And he, and he begins to be awakened to that, but not to a point of repentance, but an awareness of, of the dangerous times that he's living in. The world is in incredible upheaval, and great fear will fall upon people. I've seen that. You know, as I was in the military, and uh, I had friends. We were, we were, I was uh, with the 82nd Airborne. We, were, we used to jump out of helicopters and planes and things like that. And, and I had a friend of mine who, um, his name was Danny, who really, really uh, didn't enjoy jumping out of planes and helicopters. For some reason, he was afraid. And so I, I, had a, I, I liked him an awful lot. He's very dear to me. But I, I really enjoyed watching him because he would do almost anything to, to avoid jumping, do almost anything. Uh, they misspelled his name. His name was Ronald, Roland, actually, but he looked at the manifest and it said Ronald Diaz, and he says, my name's not Ronald, my name's Roland, so I don't have to jump. I mean, he was the kind of person who would find almost any excuse not to get in that helicopter. Now, on the other hand, I, 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 for some reason, I really enjoyed jumping. That was just something I really liked doing. The very first jump that I ever jumped was out of a C-141 jet. And uh, I was the uh, fourth or fifth, maybe the sixth man in the stick. I was the sixth person out the door. And I, I can still remember the first jump as they open up this wind foil and you're, you're only about 1,500 feet above the, of the ground and you're traveling. I forget how fast you're going, miles per hour and all. But uh, I remember you stand there and you, you put your static line on. Um, you hook up and you just kind of close ranks and you watch these two lights. There's one that's red and there's one that's green and you have a black hat. You, your jump master who's standing there by the door and, and when that door opens up and then that wind foil goes out and you can hear the sound of it and it's just real exciting. It's very much of an adrenaline rush, you know, and then it, and they close you up and so that you're right next to your buddy. So if you don't want to jump, you're going out anyway because the people behind you will shove you literally out the door. That's how that's going to be. So <laughs> you're, you're you're going, doesn't really matter whether you want to or not. And so as we're standing there, I can still remember as they say, tighten up, and we got close to one another, and you watch this red light, and as you watch the red light, 
You're waiting for the jump master's command, and you've been trained for the last two weeks to jump on command, and so you're just waiting, and you got your eye right on this red light, and then the light turns green, and when the light goes green, you're out the door, and you have to, you pause for one second in between, and so you just, somebody pops, and then you jump out, and then the next, and, and, and so I was, I, I think around the sixth out the door, but I jumped too quickly, so the guy in front of me, when his shoot popped, I landed right on top of his chute. I sat on the very center of it, and I still remember that. I, I was just kind of sitting there, and, and it's, it's, it's like it's all slow motion. It's like, it really is. It's like everything is in slow motion, so I landed on his chute. Now, that's not a good thing <laughs> for the guy that has the chute that you're sitting on, because it can collapse his chute. If it collapses his chute, I'm fine because my chute's above his and I'll be okay as he drops. But he wasn't real happy and he began to scream, you know, get off my chute, get off my chute. And I'm still sitting there and this is all within like two seconds, three seconds. And I'm just sitting there going, and I still remember sliding off the edge, just kind of pushing like you're on a slide and sliding off the edge and then the chute pops and then you kind of float down. I loved it. That was a kind of, it just, I cannot explain the joy and the enjoyment of being crazy. It's just a good, it's a, it's a good thing. Now, my friend Danny didn't like that. And I can still remember, you know, he had the bravado and all of that, you know, the airborne mentality until we were sitting on a helicopter. When you go into a helicopter, you're 1,500 feet. And there are three, I think three or four of us who, who sit uh, cross-legged at the, at the, at the um, edge of the platform there, and there's a little strap in front of you, and you sit there like this, holding your chute, and um, then they remove that strap, and then the black hat will say, go, and then each one jumps out like that. And so I was the second, and Danny was the first, and, I, I, and what they do is you have these helicopter pilots who like to mess with you. And so they'll, they'll fly and then they'll just dip the helicopter so that you're going like, like that, going forward and then they'll, then they'll dip it so that the other guys, I like that. I enjoy that kind of thing. So for me, it's going, yeah, this is, this is, this is fun. So as we're doing that, Danny, Mr. Bravado, is sitting next to me and I turned to him, and, I, and I, I still remember turning to him and saying, Man, Danny, isn't this a blast? But this boy was praying. His eyes were closed. His mouth was moving. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> you see, when everything is peaceful, we don't need God. When everything's fine, we don't need God. When everything is working for us in our life, we don't need God. He's the one we call on only when we're having problems. He's the one we call on when we're saying, you know, it's not happening for me right now. I need some help. And, and part of what happens through this tribulation period is the Lord wakes people up. Some people do come to faith in him, but the majority do not. They do not. And so what happens is when they see these terrible things happening in nature, listen, let's face it, you can be the bravest person in the building, maybe the baddest person in that bar, and you know it. And you're in that bar and you look around and you're thinking within yourself, I'm young, I'm strong, I can beat anybody up in this bar, I'm not afraid of anyone. And then an earthquake happens and you're a little girl running out, shoving people out of the way, aren't you? How bad really are you? Because you encounter something better than you. Earthquakes have a tendency of doing that, don't they? They show you your priorities, don't they? Years ago, my babies were very small at the time. And uh, Marie and I were asleep. An earthquake hit in the middle of the night. And I, all I know is the bed was moving. And then I heard something flying past me. It was Marie. She jumped over me because I have an assigned place. You guys have an assigned place? I have an assigned place. I didn't know I had an assigned place. That's part of the marriage contract. I didn't read it closely enough. You will sleep on this side of the bed for the rest of your life and you will like it. It was in the fine print. But anyway, I was on my side. I was on my side of the bed next to the door 
when I felt something just fly over me and I saw it disappearing down the hall. It was my wife. And she was getting the babies out of bed. Get up, children, get up. And she had them all under the door, the door jams there, and she left me. <laughs> and so she, she, she comes to bed, because I never got up. And I said, man, I mean, you just told me something, didn't you? I said, you're out there saving our babies, and you left me to die? She goes, you're a big boy. You could get up if you wanted to. They're too small. I have to get them up. But I haven't forgotten <laughs> what your priorities are really ex are exposed in the heat of the moment. And I haven't forgotten. <laughs> so we can be as bad as you want to be. You can talk about how bad you really are and all of that, and maybe you are. But there's always something better than you are. Always. Always. There will always be someone better than you, always somebody stronger than you. And if you are the heavyweight champion of the world, eventually you're going to be an old man. Muhammad Ali is a great example. I can beat anybody in the world for a while. No more. He's just a memory, right? There's always something better than you. There's always something greater than you. And when you get down to it, God is greater than earthquakes, but earthquakes seems to serve the purpose of causing men to be greatly afraid. Because when God allows his nature that he controls just to erupt a little bit, well, the Bible tells us what's going to take place. Men's hearts will fail them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And these people are going to have incredible fear, and fear will be rampant. And then what happens? Well, verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Rawl used to be real mad at this passage, by the way, because he thought it said coming with power and Greg glory, and that's not what it says. It's a, he says, how come Greg gets to come back with Jesus? Now, what this says to us is that it's a literal return. His return is going to be seen because his return is literal. He didn't come invisibly, and it's not like his spirit is here right now in an invisible way forever. No, his return is literal. Remember in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, when uh, the uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were speaking to some angels and uh, were concerned because they had watched Jesus uh, as he ascended into heaven. But the angel spoke to them and said, uh, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So his return will be seen because his return is literal. That's why Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him. And they also who who pierced him, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now notice when he says all kindreds of the earth will wail because of him. Zechariah gives us more insight in Zechariah chapter 12 verses 10 and 11 because there the Lord God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be great. And so this speaks of the return of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting to me, especially when you look at Zechariah 12, 10, and 11, how it says, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. And you can ask the question, uh, a well-known um, Christian evangelist was speaking to the prime minister of Israel many years ago now and brought up Zechariah 12, 10, and 11 and asked the question, who is speaking when it says, they will look on me whom they have pierced? And uh, the writer, or rather the, uh, the prime minister said, well, that's God speaking. And then the next question came, when did you pierce your God? When did you pierce your God? And the answer is, when Jesus died on the cross, he was pierced for us there. And it's very clear here. 
And it says here, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And so there's going to be a sense when the Lord Jesus returns, those who have been purged are going to see him and finally understand what happened. He says they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when it says coming in a cloud, in Scripture, the image of clouds is used figuratively as well as literally. In, in Psalm 104, verse 3, the psalmist said, He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. But if it's literal, it would be speaking of his return with his armies because his armies are given the image of clouds. In Jude, verse 19, Enoch said... Um, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. So he's returning with his armies, which are an image of clouds. Now, the multitude that returns includes the angels who did not fall in rebellion. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 following says, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and be admired in all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now, one thing I'd like to say as, a, as an aside here in 2 Thessalonians 1, when he says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. One real brief thing. Uh, Jesus said it this way, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. James tells us that we are not to be forgetful hearers of the word of God, but we are to be doers because if we're forgetful hearers, we ultimately are simply deceiving ourselves. And I have to tell you, and I'm not sure if this is simply the Holy Spirit working for this moment in my life, I've been in the ministry for 35 years. I started ministering the Word of God at the age of 23. I'm 58. 35 years of my life has been given over to doing what I'm doing right now. I've been pastoring this church for over 27 years. I've been a pastor for over 29 years. 35 years of ministry, 29 years as a pastor, 27 years as a founding pastor, senior pastor of this church. I have seen over 35 years, thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this church. If we were to have a reunion of the people who at one time called this their church and just they always show up at one time, we'd need a building that seats about 30,000 people. You can go into the hall and you can look at some of those pictures from 1990 and can see that we were already ministering to 4,000 people during that time. And so I say all of that to say this. At this period in my ministry, I have never had greater concern for the state of the flock than I do right now. I have never had greater fear in my heart for people in this church than I do right now. I have great concern for my fellowship. And I don't know if this is too heavy for you or if you came to hear this. Forgive me if it's too heavy, but this is the truth. This is what, where my heart is right now. I know too many people who are aware of Bible verses who flat out just don't care what it says. They don't read the Word most of the time anyway in this church. For many in this church, I'm sad to report, but it's true. The only time the Bible's opened up is when I say, let's turn to Luke 21. Or when I say, let's open our Bibles to John 18. It's the only time their Bible's been open that week. And I know that. And so, in many ways, God's people have a lack of knowledge because they're not in his word. Because to them, the word is not the delight of their eyes. It isn't what causes the rejoicing of their heart. It's not. For them, it's, 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 uh, it's just a book. I mean, this is interesting. It's kind of like science fiction. They, they grab hold of some things. They, they like the word grace a lot because for them, grace gives them permission to do pretty much anything they want. And I can still go to heaven because heaven for them is, well, pretty much everybody goes there anyway, don't they? 
And, and you know, yeah, sin is, is bad, but we all sin. I cannot tell you how many discussions I have had over the years with people who minimize sin to give themselves an excuse to continue in it. And then if I say, but, but the Word says this, which I've done, as you can imagine, so many times, for them to say, you're legalistic. Where's your grace? You're not loving me. And I think, are you kidding me? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm telling you the truth. And it'll set you free. But how can you continue in sin with full knowledge of what Jesus Christ did for you? How can you continue doing the things that you argue with me and say, that's okay, I can drink anytime I want to and still go to it. How, how can you do that? Where is your love for Jesus Christ? See, so I have great concern. Now, I'm not saying this to you personally unless it applies to you personally. And if it does, do something about it. Change. Repent. Because I'm telling you, the thing that I am greatly afraid of is the fact that many so-called believers don't really have a grip of what it costs Jesus for us to be set free from sin. And if I've been set free, well, Jesus said, then you're free indeed. You are completely free. So why do I keep returning to the things that I've been washed from? Unless... I never really repented from those things. I'm telling you, I know of a pastor, he no longer occupies a pulpit, hasn't for 15 years, who had a seven-year affair, seven years, and uh, finally was found out and left the ministry, thank God. But when asked, how could you stand up on a Sunday morning and preach the Holy Word of God? How could you do that? His answer was, well, every Saturday night I repented. And I went to the pulpit forgiven. Is that right? Listen, I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. And as a little boy, probably didn't understand what I was taught. Because I remember being taught if you forget a sin and you go to confession, it's forgiven. And I had convenient lapses of memory every time I went to the confessional. I forgot all kinds of sins. But we were given a state of grace for 24 hours. So after confession, I was in a state of grace, which meant that I could go and receive communion the next day. So on Saturday, I would go to confession. I'd be in a state of grace. I'd go and receive communion. And then I'd go and sin like crazy for the next six days. And that was my mentality of grace. You go and get someone to say, it's okay. And then you're in grace. And you better hope you die in grace. Because if you don't, mm. But for me, I was taking my chances as long as I have extreme unction, last rites have a good confession, and have a wife that'll pray my soul out of purgatory, I feel pretty good. And that's, that's, that was my religious background. So when I got saved, I, 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 I began to learn some things about following God. And, and over the years, finally came to realize that God is a holy God, and I'm an unholy man, and I need to understand some things I understand, I need to understand that, that those who are judged are those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is possible, it is entirely possible to self-deceive, to make myself think that because I said a prayer, I went forward, I go to church, I must be a Christian. I can deceive myself when I have never actually said God I am a rotten sinner. I'm responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. Forgive me. Because I'll, I'm telling you, 
I'm telling you, there are an awful lot of people who could care less, and even right now could care less about what I'm saying. Huh? Could care less because that's going to interrupt your partying this weekend if you actually get serious. See, religion's okay for fanatics like you, Pastor, because that's how you make your living. But you don't understand real people. The real people have to go out into the real world and have real jobs, and they really have to do real things, and, and you don't. And so that's the excuse we make. See, Pastor, you're, you're not supposed to fornicate, and you're not supposed to go out on your wife. You're not supposed to drink and all that because you're a pastor. But see, I'm just an ordinary sheep. I can do what I want when I want. And God loves me just as much as he loves you. It's all grace. I've had lectures on grace from people who don't understand what it is. And I'm telling you, we have to not only hear, but the fruit of a real faith is to obey. That's why Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you what? If you do them. Because a man who is building his life on sinking sand and the man who is building his life on a sure foundation both encounter the same kinds of problems, storms and waves and destruction. But one man's house falls and the other man's house remains and Jesus tells us why. Because one built on the rock he heard and he did. See, so my exhortation to us is to be careful that we don't deceive ourselves into thinking, yeah, I'm fine because... No, wait a minute. See, I, I actually review my walk with the Lord on a daily basis, you know. I, I check my condition before the Lord because having preached to others, I don't want to find myself a castaway. I, I want to make sure that my walk remains solid. So here, I shared my heart with you greatly concerned about that, greatly concerned because it's very possible, guys, and you know this to be true, to hear a life-changing message and to not be changed by that message, to say, you know, well, I'll hear you another time or I'll think about that, but you don't understand what it's going to cost me. You, you don't know how good looking that girl is on that job site. You, you don't know how easy it is for me to steal from my boss. You, you don't know how depressed I am and how much I need that one. You don't know these things. Well, what I do know is a God who is able to give to me purity and strength and power to overcome. I know a God like that. And, and, and maybe you don't. And maybe you need to. Probably do. And see, that's the whole point. The Lord is returning. And there will be those who reject him. But... He says in verse 28, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. You see, in the book of Revelation in chapter 6, there are the souls of those who have been beheaded for their, their faith in Jesus Christ and, and they're crying out underneath the throne of the Lord. It's found in Revelation 6.10. They're saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, their prayer is finally answered because in the Lord's return, there's now a time of joy. Those who are alive and remain, who have made it through that tribulation, it's time for them to look up, to raise their heads, and they do so in joy because redemption has now been fully realized. Because Jesus has come to rule and to reign. And they now enter into that peace that they so longed for and that they didn't really have in a physical sense throughout that period called the tribulation. And so that's why Jesus would say, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. It's something that these who are going through that time will have an opportunity to rejoice because the Lord has come and the pain is over.